Welcome everyone to another edition of our inaugural season of Masonic Light Talk. I'm your host, Past Master Rod Funderburk of Bivouac Lodge number 503. And we are hailing from Winston-Salem, North Carolina and are a part of the 30th district where our worshipful master is Dewan A. Muhammad and our district deputy is Terry Andrews. And of course, our North Carolina jurisdiction is led by none other than our fearless leader and grand master, most worshipful grand master, Daniel D.T. Thompson. And the true purpose of a Masonic Light Talk is to give the craft and everyone out there a chance to see the men behind the Grand Lodge titles and various titles in the houses and to allow everyone to see that, hey, we're all regular people with regular life experiences and we all experience the good, the bad, and sometimes ugly in our lives. And we also wanted to be clear, you know, people ask a lot about, you know, what do Masons do, what Masons are all about. But one of the things that I always want everyone to know is we are here, Masons are here to make good men, better men in each aspect of their life. And today we have a very special guest with us. He is the right worshipful James C. Russell, Deputy Grand Master of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of North Carolina and Jurisdictions Incorporated. And he is with us right now. Uh, Grand how are you doing? Grant Russell, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine this morning. Blessed. I'm blessed. Good, good. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And um, I had found out that you're actually originally from Virginia, uh, yes. the Mecklenburg County area. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Good deal. Now, you know, we got a Mecklenburg County right here in North Carolina as well, yes, down I, on the Charlotte end. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're also a graduate of North Carolina a and uh, university, and that is awesome. That is all Aggie we got a lot of Aggie bread. That's it, Aggie pride. We have a lot of Aggie family around the Masonic family as well. Yes, sir. Yes. How are you and your family during this doing during this COVID nineteen epidemic that we have going We're on? We're doing well. All my family are safe. Good, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Grand, um, something I want to always get right into is, you know, we do always have a life outside of masonry. And I didn't realize that you were actually a teacher, um, yes. a vocational teacher. Yes. And I commend you for that because we need so many more teachers. My mother was a teacher. Uh, she taught school for 32 years. And of course, you were a teacher. But your teaching was a little bit different. Would you kind of go in and tell us, um, you know, who you catered to and who your audience was when you were uh, teaching? Um, I was employed by the Division of Human Resources, uh, uh, employed by the North Carolina Rehabilitation Center for the Blind. Mm -hmm. All of my clients were blind or visually impaired or deaf. And um, I began teaching in 1979, and uh, that was a brand new endeavor for me because when I went for my job interview, my boss was blind, totally blind. Oh, wow. And yes, yes, he was blind. And he gave me the interview, I interviewed, and then I began work uh, once I was hired. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the things that I taught, um, I graduated with, uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Arts Education. And basically that is classes dealing with woodworking. That was my primary goal to teach because my idea was to teach in the public schools. But for somehow or another, my attention got veered to the rehabilitation part. And so once, uh, and that now, imagine my students were blind or visually impaired. I had to teach them how skills of how to operate power equipment, like uh, table saws, radial arm saws, power equipment. Um, I taught other areas other than um, woodworking, including small engine repair. I taught basket making. I taught chair caning, mm -hmm. hammock making. Um, I also taught horticulture in the later years. And uh, in the later years, they changed the program. And then um, my task became uh, a careers. I taught careers, job seeking skills, resume writing, and horticulture. So just imagine trying to do that. With, now, I had, to, I had to be trained with in-service training of how to work with the blind and visually impaired. I also had to learn sign language as well to work with those who were deaf. 
and those that were deaf blind, we communicated with them as well. So my job was very, very challenging. And I guess that's why I stayed there so long. I really did love my job. Yeah, you were there for, was it over 33 years? 33 years. Wow, that is amazing. And God bless you for doing that. You know, I'm sure it took patience. Um, it took an understanding that these people really needed you because, you know, it's a, already a challenge to teach someone who's different from us just physically the way they look. But now you're talking about teaching someone who's not able to use one or possibly two of their five senses, that being mm -hmm. their ears and their eyes. And for you to do that, I mean, that had to be a calling directly from God because you also had to go the extra mile, like you said. You oh, yeah. had to actually learn sign language. Wow. I commend you for that. God bless you for that. And I know you will have a serious reward when everything <laughs> is said and done. Thank you Thank so you. much for that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We're going to flip the page and get back over to a little bit more Masonic light talk. And uh, Grant, tell us what lodge that you're hailing from. I hail from Newberry Lodge, number 252 in Creedmoor, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about your Masonic journey. What brought you into Masonry? How did you find it interesting? How did your Masonic journeys begin? Well, my grandfather, my father, and two of my brothers, and I had uncles who were Masons. Mm -hmm. But you know how it is, they never told you anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So when I was uh, working at the Rehabilitation Center for the Blind, I was approached by a brother um, about um, possibly joining the, the craft. Mm -hmm. And so that's when my journey started in 1983 when I became a Mason. That's when I was raised in 1983. Wow, wait, um, raised in 1983. I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes during the Masonic family. That yes. is all. Yes, yes, sir. What are some of the previous positions that you uh, held, not only in the Blue House, uh, but maybe any other houses that you decided to join, if you don't mind telling, sharing that with you? Well, the first position I held in the Blue House was Junior Warden. Beautiful. I served two years as junior warden, two years as senior warden, and two years as wishful master. Beautiful. Beautiful. And from that, I joined the consistory. I'm a member of Henderson Consistory Number 195 in Henderson, North Carolina. Um, I think the first position I served there was um, second lieutenant commander. I served as first lieutenant commander and also as, um, as commander in chief. And I served about eight or nine years as um, keeper of Sears and Archives. Oh, wow. Good yeah. deal. That is awesome. Yes. Now, is there a position that is a little more dear to your heart than another? Well, uh, I, I guess you could say being a secretary. It seems like every organization I'm in, I end up being secretary some way or another. Yes, sir. Also in the consistory, well, you know, a member of the uh, United Supreme Council, uh, I became a 33rd in the year of 2006. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, I was crowned or coronated as Sovereign Grand Inspector General down in Jacksonville, Florida. And that was, that was a special, that was really special because I had no idea about that until I showed up uh, yes, at the meeting on that. Yep, now those are always the special ones, those surprises that we get. Yes, sir, that yeah. is awesome. Well, Grand, uh -huh. sure. no, go ahead, please. Yeah, also, I'm also a member of Emran Temple 168 out of Henderson, North Carolina. And also, um, I served there as um, a recorder for a total of 10 years. Oh, wow. And wow. so right now, you know, I'm an honorary past potentate. That's my title in the temple. Okay. But I, continue, I, I work in any organization that I'm in. And that's what it's all about, continuing to work, serve the community, and do all that you can do. Because even the good book tells us, regardless of what position that you take, whether it's at work, whether it's in a community, whatever it is in life, do it to the fullest. Do the best that you can do. Put all your heart, soul, and mind into it, and God will bless us. That, that is, is awesome. And, and I can see that he has blessed you tremendously. And now... Uh, Grand, you are our Deputy Grand Master. You're the most worshipful Deputy Grand Master of North Carolina jurisdiction. And, you know, I know a lot of people may not understand the title. They may not understand what it means and they may not know much behind it. But 
some people might think, hey, it's full of glamour. It's uh, you wear a lot of gold, you wear a, a, a lot of fizz, and you wear a lot of this, and you're looking pretty all the time. Uh, but they don't understand that there's much more that goes into it. There's a lot of work into it. Would you uh, share with us what it means to be the deputy grand master? What sacrifices have you had to uh, give up when it comes to family, and what duties come along with being the deputy grand master? Being the deputy grand master, basically, I'm the grand master's right hand man. You know, I'm there for the grand master regardless. Uh, and yes, it's a lot of sacrifice involved. And my areas of responsibility is basically I uh, oversee the uh, award, Grand Lodge Awards Program, I oversee the Grand Lodge Budget and Finance Program, the annual Grand Communication Program, mm -hmm. the Scholarship Program. Um, the time cards where I'm responsible for approving the, uh, the payroll for the month. Um, and that's basically, and it requires you to spend some time in the Grand Lodge itself. I mean, you have to learn the business because the Grand Lodge is a business and you have to run it as such. Yes, so sir. there are times that uh, I have to be on site and I try to go to the Grand Lodge at least two or three, two, at least twice a month, twice a week, twice mm -hmm. a week, excuse me. And yes, there's sometimes, depending upon what, what I'm working on, I'm over there more. But um, as far as the, you know, you already understand about the annual, um, the annual grand session program, that, that's a huge, that's a huge uh, program right there where, you know, you organize and get everything in place for your grand sessions. Yes, and with the Grand Lodge Awards program, all of the awards as they come in for those that have done hard work and are going to receive awards at the Grand Lodge. I correlate those and we make choices on those as well. The Grand Lodge Scholarship Program, each of our districts receive a thousand dollar scholarship. And so it's their responsibility to get that information in to me and I correlate that and turn it over to the chairman of the scholarship committee for his work to begin with that. So yes, the, uh, and I must put this and this comes with any job that you do and as other duties are assigned. <laughs> and, th and those duties could be anything at any given point, I assume. <laughs> those duties could be anything at any given point. You're exactly right. <laughs> yes, sir. And I'll tell you, I know you have done a great job, but you also have a lot of responsibility for our uh, annual Grand Lodge raffle um, that we uh, do yes. each year. Uh, would you just uh, kind of share with the people what that raffle is all about and uh, what you have to do to put it together and the goals of it? The, the gr annual Grand Lodge raffle is one where we raise money for scholarships, we raise money for charitable organizations, and we also raise money, you know, for our program and uh, our accounts. Um, now, that comes in, my responsibility comes in in choosing the prize that we're going to use, uh, ordering the tickets, setting up the whole program so that we can disperse these tickets to our jurisdiction, to our lodges and whoever wants those. So yes, yeah, a lot goes into that, uh, the planning, you know, the paperwork and everything that goes along with that, because then I have to send information out to the jurisdiction about what we're doing, when we're doing it, and what the other expect expectations are. Yes, sir. So and you know job. Just know that it's, that one is not a small job because there are a lot of intricate details involved with it. One of the good details, um, like you just said, it raises money for scholarships and programs that we use each year, but also the lodges who help sell those Grand Lodge tickets. Um, you and the Grand Lodge, you have set it up so that those lodges can benefit uh, monetarily for their own personal lodge uh, whenever they sell so many tickets, which is a great thing for the lodges because they can take that money and also use it for the com local communities that they're involved in. So that is a wonderful program and uh, uh, a fundraiser that you have and that you're in charge of. And mm -hmm. uh, I commend you because you have done a wonderful job. And, and I want to tell you, thank you so much for helping me get my Grand Lodge tickets <laughs> as well. Because, you know, we went through a lot with COVID-19 yes. going on where there was some yes. You know, things in and out that we couldn't do and we had to follow certain rules and protocol because of COVID-19. Yes. But thank you so much for all the help that you gave me. I really appreciate it. 
Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of COVID-19, you know, COVID-19 has interrupted our normal daily and day-to-day -day activities, uh, as well as some of our Masonic goals from now. Are you able to share with us any of the day-to-day -day business that is moving from the Grand Lodge or something that um, COVID-19 has, uh, you know, disrupted us about? Maybe some of the folks out here aren't aware of what's happening. Could you, could you share anything like that with us? Well, at this point, uh, with COVID, it is a very dangerous um, disease. And as of March is when the Grand Master closed the lodges from having direct meetings. Mm -hmm. And yes, COVID has interrupted uh, that quite a bit. You know, we don't want anybody to get sick. Yes, and we don't want, want that responsibility on our hands. So right now, uh, since the governor has gone to 2.2 in his program, of uh, us getting back to norm some type of normalcy, the Grand Master will make an announcement on next Sunday, which is the 27th, of how we will pro we'll proceed um, with COVID from, from now on. Okay, that sounds good. So we're, we're continuing to stay along with how the governor wants us to proceed and continue to do our business daily in the North Carolina. Yeah. Okay, good deal, good deal. Well, Gran, are you ready to let us know if you are planning on running for Deputy Grand Master again, or are you uh, planning on moving to higher higher visions? Uh, I'm not sure if we're, which protocol that we're in. Um, I know our Grand Master was saying that uh, usually three years, and he wanted us kind of to start rotating ends and out of seats and things like that. Uh, and technically, if that is the case, his three years might be up this go round. Is there, do you have any plans of doing anything that you can share with us? Well, it's like this, uh, Brother Funderburg. Mm -hmm. When the opportunity presents itself, I will be running for the higher office. I do understand that. Well, I tell you what, you have done a wonderful job in the offices that you've had. Uh, you've done a wonder, you're doing a wonderful job as a deputy grandmaster now. And you are easily accessible to anyone uh, who may not have tried to get in touch with you or who just thinks that you're not accessible. That is definitely not the case. You're easily accessible. You, and if you're busy and we have to leave you a message, you always get right back to us. And that is something that is awesome. And that's part of what our brotherhood is all about, continuing to serve and help one another the way that we should. And Deputy Grandmaster, is there anything that you would like to share with us or, or the Masonic family, uh, not only concerning Grand Lodge, but also maybe concerning yourself, something that we don't know about you that you'd like to share with us? Well, um, a lot of people don't know. I'm one of eight children. I have, mm -hmm. it's four boys and four girls, and we all are pretty close. And uh, we all basically came up the same way, and we basically have the same mindset. Um, but I like to say to the jurisdiction, um, uh, I'd like to thank all the brothers, the sisters, and all of the entire Masonic family for all that they do in the, in the name of Masonry. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, we all, this is a beautiful institution. It's an, an important institution, and we must all act and protect this institution to the best of our abilities for what it is to us and for what it means to us because I look for masonry to continue for years and years to come. But Beautiful. it's not what masonry does for us, it's what we can do for masonry to improve it. Yes, sir, that is absolutely correct. And I would love for you to reiterate something that I have to tell people, individuals all the time. People come up to me and say, what are you masons all about? I heard that you do this, everything from, you know, devil worshiping to sacrificing people and things of that nature. And I always tell them, no, there is nothing that we do that does not involve, number one, our Heavenly Father, the Supreme Being who we believe in. There is nothing that we ask you to do that will go against any principles of the Bible at all. And people, you know, they say, well, really? And I think it's mainly because, you know, as you said, your grandfather and your father and your uncles, just really never share anything with you. So then people begin going and making their own presumptions. Can you tell us about masonry? Anyone out there who just may say, huh, I have no idea. It could be something crazy. Masonry could be this or that. What would you like to tell those folks? Well, first of all, it's a brotherhood. Yes. 
It's a brotherhood that's for, filled with love. Mm -hmm. And if the brotherhood hood is filled with love, then I'm going to treat my brother in a loving manner. Yes. So um, it is a beautiful institution. And what we do basically is try to find good men and make them better men. And that's what we're all about. That's what we're all about. Um, right. You know, to be one, you ask one. Right. You know, and that's when the learning begins. And I can tell anyone that if they ever decide to ask one to be one, they will be in it for life. That is correct. And they will enjoy every bit every of service day. that they give every day. Yes. Because we've had so many opportunities. I know I've seen you have those opportunities where you can have someone smiling after you've given them the service that they've needed, whether it's been a child, whether it's been a widow, or whether it's been another brother or another brother's family. Mm -hmm. And even at the time when we have to leave this earth, because we all have a date that we have to yeah. leave this earth, yeah. and we have helped so many families through that process alone. I'm sure you have been involved in it more than a handful of times. Yes. And it is just so heartwarming and heartfelt when those families tell you, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for helping us through this hard time. And people just don't understand that. And it is so sincere. And like you said, it is brotherly love, mm -hmm. Deputy Grandmaster. And I thank you for those words. And Deputy, as we get ready to wrap up right now, is there anything else that you would like to share before we get ready and wrap up? Well, I'd just like to say that I, I, I love this organization. Uh, it, it means the world to me. And all I want to do is to make everyone have a true understanding of what masonry is all about and to share that, share God's love with everyone. Yes, sir. God bless you for those words, Deputy Graham Russell. And that's going to do it for our time today on Masonic Light Talk. I want to thank you so much for taking thank the you time. So much. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed yes, it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are just a wonderful person to be around. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to just come grace me, us, the family, with yeah. your presence. And I really hope to have you back soon. And I hope to be able to uh, spend some time with you outside of this forum and continue to get to know you uh, and the one-on-one -on -one personal basis in that brotherly love that you talk. Okay. okay. And our, for our listeners out here, Prince Hall family, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this edition of Masonic Light Talk, featuring our Deputy Grand Master, Brother James C. Russell. And for those of you who are not a part of the Masonic family, remember, it's not hard to be a part of this family. In order to be one, just ask one. Yes. And I'm your host, Past Master Rod Funderburg of Bivouac Lodge number 503. I can't wait to see you on the next edition of Masonic Light Talk. Until then, my brothers and sisters, travel light. Stay safe and out of the way of COVID-19.